Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to Like a Boss Now. I'm Kate Simmons Tillotson. We started our Like a Boss Now journey eight weeks ago while it was snowing and we were wearing wool socks and slippers. And we're now at our final Like a Boss Now, eight weeks later in what seems like the heat of summer. Today, we'll be hearing from our final Like a Boss Now guest, Mike Simons of Unum. We're so pleased that he can join us today. But first, I'd like to thank a moment to thank all of you for being a part of this series, asking questions, saying hello. It's meant so much from all of us to hear from you. I'd also like to give our deepest thanks to the CEOs who joined us to so candidly talking about leading their companies through these times. They are Joan Fortin of Bernstein Scher, John Steiker of Stonewall Kitchen, Leanne Leahy of the VIA Agency, Kristen Maley of the Good Shepherd Food Bank, Glenn Cummings of the University of Southern Maine, Steve Smith of L.L. Bean, Mike Bork of Memic, and Dr. Edson Liu of the Jackson Laboratory. Thank you so much to all of them for joining us. And you can also watch their talks in the link in chat. So, but never fear, we'll be back in the fall with more Like a Boss for You with Dr. Clayton Rose of Bowdoin and Liz Cotter Schlacks of United Way. And I promise you'll get an email or two as those events are scheduled on the calendar. Next, we're so appreciative of our Like a Boss presenting sponsors. They've been with us since the very beginning and we couldn't do it without them. And they are Bernstein Schur and Hub International. We'd also like to thank Harvard Pilgrim Healthcare, JP Morgan Chase, Vistage, and Coffee by Design. I'd now like to introduce Peter Fendler of Hub Investments to say a few words. Peter. Thanks, Kate. Uh, good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to the final event of Like a Boss Now series. Um, I'm Peter Fendler, as Kate mentioned, Managing Director at Hub International. Uh, it's hard to believe that it's gone by so quick since April, and, and uh, Joan and I have been at it uh, since the beginning, and uh, Joan was the first speaker with Bernstein Schur uh, back in April. Um, you know, we couldn't be happier that we sponsored this program, and I want to thank the Press Herald again for partnering us with us and all the great work that they're doing. Today's boss, Mike Simons and his team at, at Unum have been great partners of our organization over the past 30 plus years. Uh, and together, I think we've helped a lot of people through some of the most difficult times in their lives. Uh, we hope that you've learned as much as we have about the tremendous and adaptable, particularly underscore adaptable business leaders we have here in Maine. Um, I think we're all proud of the place that we work and live and call home. And Hub is thrilled to support the community in both uh, good and bad times that we're kind of living through now. On behalf of all my colleagues at Hub, I want to thank all of you in the audience for making our community a positive, optimistic, and enduring one. If we can be of help to you, please let us know. We're here, we're here to help. Thanks. Thank you, Peter. And it's so great to see everyone chiming in to say hello and chat. <coughs> I'm sure that your chat setting is set to everyone. Um, and it's great to see everyone waving hello. I'd now like to introduce the CEO of Bernstein Shore, Joan Fortin. Joan. Hello, everyone. Thanks for joining us today for the last session of Like a Boss Now. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, Bernstein Shore is so pleased to be able to sponsor this series as we've all um, worked to lead our companies and our teams and our various organizations through these unprecedented times. There's obviously no playbook for any of us to follow. So we're kind of all in this together, learning from each other and helping each other along the way. So I think this series is especially important right now and it's been hugely valuable to me personally. So I wanna thank the Portland Press Herald for doing these series and it's been a real honor for us to sponsor. I'm really pleased to be here. In terms of today's guest, uh, clearly Lisa decided to take us out with a bang um, Mike's got such an impressive career and um, is such a, a well-established leader um, and a pillar of our community. And uh, so I'm really excited to hear from Mike and I wanna say congratulations on his recent promotion um, from this last February. So if we don't need more evidence of his great leadership, um, I think we'll be hearing more about that shortly. So I'm really looking forward to hearing from you. Um, thanks for being with us today, Mike, and thank you again to Lisa, Kate, and the Portland Press Herald for leading these conversations. It's been wonderful. Thank you, Joan. Now, without further ado, I'd like to introduce the publisher and CEO of Masthead Maine, Lisa DeSisto, 
and the CEO of Unum, Mike Simons. Thank you so much, Kate, and thank you to Joan, thank you to Peter. We so appreciate your continued support of everything that we do at the Press Herald. So welcome, Mike, you're batting cleanup in Like a Boss Now, no pressure. I have to say, I mean, listening to the guests that you've had um, and listening along the way, it's an impressive group, flattered to be included. And uh, thanks, Joan and Peter, for your kind words. And Peter, absolutely, so many um, great years working together, protecting folks. So I really appreciate the kind words at the intro. Um, when you think of the roster of the folks that we had, one of the things that really jumps out for me is just how transparent and um, and just empathetic um, and kind so many of the leaders of Maine's companies are to share this time with us and also share their insight on what they're going through. Yeah, so it's totally right, Lisa, that the, there is no playbook for kind of what we're in right now. And I have just been, I've been blown away with just the sense of community as leaders from all types of organizations from the state, city, uh, not for profit, for profit, you know, working together in a very transparent way. It's been terrific. Yeah, it's one of the many things that's so special and awesome uh, about our community here in Maine. So your name has come up repeatedly uh, as a guest for Like a Boss. So thank you for joining us at Like a Boss now. But you, I'm booking you already today for 2021. And we're going to have you in person for the full length version where we do the Wayback Machine, find out where you're from, what your first job was. So we're going to get that on the calendar for sure. Oh, unless you absolutely bomb today. And then I'll <laughs> no, I was going to say, wait, Lisa, you're jinxing me, really. This yeah. is terrible. So um, let's start out with just give us the, the highlights of Unum. Everyone knows Unum as one of Maine's largest employers, but just give us the, you know, Unum at a glance look. Yeah, sure. So Unum's uh, business is employee benefits. So when you go to work uh, from a very small uh, company with a couple of employees all the way up to some of the largest um, in the U.S. or the U.K. or in Poland, uh, we provide life insurance and disability insurance, dental, vision benefits, and um, return to work services and help employers increasingly manage employee leaves, which in the current environment is proven to be a really, really important and busy time. We've got about um, 11,000 employees around the globe. Our biggest single spot is right here in the state of Maine where we have about 2,800 folks. Um, our oldest predecessor company is Union Mutual, founded right here in Portland, Maine, all the way back in 1848. So that's, that's Unum in a snapshot. Oh, that predates the Press Herald, 1848. That's impressive. Yeah, wow, all right. Beach town. Right. Yeah. So um, we want to spend a, a lot of time talking about your leadership um, during the COVID-19 crisis and how that's been for you. But can you just give us a brief, brief overview of your tenure at Unum? Because you started there right when you graduated from Bowdoin College, right? Yeah, that's right. Actually, I, I'll go one step back and just say um, I saw a couple of people in the chat um, coming in from Scarborough, Maine. Proud grad, Scarborough High School. Oh, and uh, then, yep, I uh, graduated from Bowdoin. Actually started at Unum while I was in school, worked my way uh, through school and, you know, did um, kind of entry level roles. My first job at Unum was temporary administrative assistant. And fortunately my mother had convinced me to take a typing test in high school. So when I had to take my typing test at Unum to get that first job, I did reasonably, uh, reasonably well. And worked there after graduating for a few years and then uh, went off to business school and did some consulting work at McKinsey and Company and then have come back uh, now for, gee, 15, 16 years. I've been back with Unum in a bunch of roles. Uh, most recently, I was uh, uh, CEO of the US, Unum US business. And then, as Joan kindly mentioned, uh, took on the chief operating officer role for all the businesses around the globe in February. So um, what is the what is the big uh, difference between your CEO of US and now your COO corporate position? Yeah, so the way that we operate is we've got um, four separate businesses in Poland and in the UK. We have a colonial life business that's domestic here, and then we have the Unum uh, US business. And we and there's a lot that happens across, but there's a lot that happens unique in each of those. Uh, business units. And so my prior job was running that business unit, which was wonderful. Uh, very, very strong team. 
and uh, had a lot of fun, a lot of success, plenty of challenges too. And now my job is actually just to support the leaders that run those businesses and help them uh, be successful any way that I can. Great. So, uh, all right. So let's uh, kind of transition to what's happened at Unum um, during the, your response to COVID. So you made a quick transition to get your 2,800 main employees working from home in record time. And now you're ready to lead the charge from the home office. What are your immediate priorities? Where do you focus? Yeah, so it was, it was the middle of March. I think it's very similar for a lot of companies. It was remarkable how quick it went from something that we were watching more or less as a news story, right, to something that was very, very real and, and decisions that you had to make in, in a short period of time. So remember very well a weekend in the middle of March where we went from um, heightened awareness and pulling out some of our disaster recovery planning to a decision over the weekend to make sure that we could get people home safely um, and productively and by Monday, we had about uh, over half of our employees home. Um, and then on Tuesday, we were well over 90%. And, and today we have about 95, 96% of all of our employees around the globe are working remotely and, and working pretty effectively. So to your question, I mean, priority one, not surprisingly, was just health and safety of our team and being sure that um, you know, we were thinking about how they could get to a safe place as quickly as they possibly can. So many unknowns still today, but certainly back in the middle of March. And I'd say we've probably transitioned. Um, you know, we've, there's no perfect date, but I'd say as we got through the month of um, April and, and turned into May, we really kind of put a stake in the ground to say, you know, May is the chance we want to get more proactive and a little less reactive. And so mm -hmm. the now has been on. Uh, what can we change about our business practices? What do we need to better support the teams and our clients? And um, yeah, making some investments along those fronts. Yeah, I feel like we spent a lot of time at the beginning just dealing with sort of tactics and logistics. And now it's almost time to pivot and start to think about business strategy more that I feel like I know for us was really put on was put on hold as we had to just make sure we could continue to operate. Now, of course, being in the employee benefits business, you're right in the middle of it. So what's the impact been on your business? Yeah, it's, it's been another really um, interesting lens for us to see what's happening with the pandemic and, and be a part um, in a small way. So we, we have about 125,000 clients um, around the U.S. that can cover about just under 40 million employees and their families. And so what we saw, just like we were experiencing here in Maine, we started to see um, COVID-related short-term disability claims. So that's one of the benefits that we provide. You get sick, hurt, yeah, Unum's there to help um, replace that paycheck. And so we started to see employees claims start to come in slowly right around the middle of March. And uh, that picked up pretty dramatically through about the middle of April and then just leveled and has not in a straight line, but has started to come down. I think to date we're about 35,000 um, STD, short-term disability related um, claims to date. And pretty much week over week, we're seeing um, a good decline, which is suggestive to us that our clients and the social distancing norms that a lot of states have adopted um, have had good effect. All right. So keep it up. That is an, an important data point. When I say keep it up, I'm talking to you, our attendees, about the social distancing and wearing your mask um, because Mike is seeing it play out in the flattening of claims at Unum. So re it's really interesting how you have that view um, into into what's happening with the pandemic. So yeah. you have a dramatic spike in claims and we've read in the Press Herald about some of the challenges that companies are having when you, you are in a business where your demand just completely spikes. How were you able to respond to that? You know, um, first and foremost, it's, it's really the awesome team of colleagues that we have at Unum just stepping up. And um, one of the things we do is we track um, customer satisfaction. Like you can't go anywhere these days where someone's not pinging you and asking you about the experience that you just had, you know, coming out of a restaurant or stepping on a plane. We do the same thing. And in the middle of this, two weeks in, as those claims were spiking, we actually um, posted our best customer satisfaction that we ever had as a company. And what was interesting, you know, it's kind of like, wow, in the middle of a pandemic. And I think it's a testament to the people that, you know, it's never been more clear, like why we do what we do, you know, our mm -hmm. 
why we exist, but also I think it's reflective of what's happened in the outside world where I think people, um, you know, it's been such a shock that they're more appreciative and, uh, you know, there's just this, a, a better sense of like, hey, we are all in this together. And so there's a lot more, you know, people meeting people halfway, which is, which is good to see. Yeah, and I think people appreciate when, um, if you know, you're processing claims, just how responsive folks can be, how quickly you can get your question, questions answered and claims processed. So that has to play into the your high customer SAT score. Yeah, for sure. And technology, you know, that's been a big, steady piece that we've invested in um, over the last years, eight to ten years, and so moving a lot of things into a digital world where people can understand where they are in the process all the time and we can move things through much more, much more quickly and be more responsive. So you use technology to provide trans more transparency. Yeah. And it's, it's another interesting thing. And, um, you know, I, I think in the last gee, eight weeks, um, and I don't know about for you, Lisa, but certainly for me, I mean, just in our lives as consumers, our rate of understanding how to use digital tools to access things like, you know, curbside, food and grocery stores and, and if, heaven forget, you know, if you weren't doing your banking in a digital way, I mean, people are learning very, very quickly. And that's, you know, that's actually been, we've seen that. So that the people that are using, that have gotten away from kind of more traditional ways of doing business and very rapidly in just a couple of months picked up on, you know, doing business and interacting through web and through chat and through our mobile apps. It's just been phenomenal. Yeah, we've, we've absolutely seen this, seen the same thing with people's adoption specifically of the e-paper, uh, which is another read, way to read the paper. And for some of our subscribers who we thought would never make the transition, uh, they did it pretty quickly. So um, I, I totally echo that um, adoption of technology has just skyrocketed. Rocketed. So let's talk about uh, your leadership specific, specifically. So what's it been like to lead a company from the couch? Yeah, it, it's, um, it's wild, right? I mean, it's really interesting. There's a lot that's challenging and there's a lot that's really, um, you know, interesting. So uh, one, of the, one of the observations that I had just to come in has been, you know, as a, as a company and in inclusive of our um, partners, like our partners at Hub um, and our clients, you know, we're all physically separate. Right. And I would say I've never been closer connected to the people that I work with every day. And the reason is because we're all in it together. So we're all kind of in this environment. So, you know, I was, I was just looking at my calendar before jumping on this call. This is my uh, 10th meeting today. And I could never have pulled, you know, we can debate whether having 10 meetings by, you know, one o'clock is a great idea or not, but yeah. I, I would never have been able to pull that off because the reality would have been, you know, I was in an airport somewhere, or even if I was here in Portland, I'd be traveling between buildings or whatever. Now it's like, you can really have great conversations and just cover points and connect with people in five minutes, 10 minutes or 15 minutes. So I, I would say the, the importance of and the pace of communication has improved. And that's been a, been a positive. I'd say the challenge of, there's a couple, but one is just being a person that likes to connect with others, you know, I do miss being face to face. It really is as good as Zoom can be. And there's mm -hmm. no substitute mm -hmm. for that kind of connectivity. And you know, I think as a leader, there's, you know, you you got to try not to, but you internalize a lot. And you're in a period where, um, you know, there's so much change and there's so many decisions that need to be made, and there's so many questions that just feeling like you're able to stay on top of it can be, you know, can be a real challenge. And when you're, when you're, you know in your room isolated, you know, some of those feelings of like, am I running hard enough? Am I thinking about everything? Those things can, I think, build up and have a bigger impact than if you're in the middle of it and you got people on either side of you. Yeah. Um, how are you doing modeling behavior for your staff? So have you stayed away from the office? Are you emailing around the clock? It certainly seems like you have a full day of meetings. How's that all working? Yeah, pretty good. I, I'm actually, I would say, uh, I'm not great at a lot of things, but one thing that I have learned is like, I'm, I'm better at work if I can create some separation. So, mm -hmm. um, you know, there's a spot on the counter in the kitchen. When I come in, that's where the phone tends to go. And I won't tell you, I never check it all night, but, but separating, I'm definitely not a 24 hour a day kind of person online. 
Uh, uh, taking time off, actually, I have done it uh, over the course of the pandemic. Uh, it was tough in the first four or five weeks, but have done it since. And that's been a that's been a problem to solve with our employee base. It's just making sure that people just don't think um, to do it because they're already from home um, and and can't travel. Right. Uh, it is super important uh, to take the break and get away. Um, you know, that's that's some of our biggest you know problems to solve has been this compounding effect of okay, all of a sudden you're working from home, but it's not just you. I mean, you may have elder care issues where you've brought somebody back or their home care has, has, has gone away. So you, you need to provide that home care. Your kids aren't in school. So all of a sudden you've got that. And then there's just the stress. Maybe you have a partner that's lost uh, income or the household's lost some income with what's going on in the economy. And then you, you're going through your Twitter feed and watching the news and there's a lot of stress. So yeah, stay away from the Twitter. Stay away, stay, from the the Twitter. <laughs> stay, stay away from the, the Twitter. Stay away from the Twitter. Press Herald online that you can get all the news that you need. That's right. Although our, actually, our social media team does a great job on Twitter. So, um, so oh, maybe, maybe Just a make sure it's who you it. follow. Right. Yeah. yeah. So separation is huge. So right. Separation is yeah. huge. Yeah. Um, I think the vacation point is a good one. And I, I give that as a public service message to uh, any of our attendees. Definitely after this um, session you should just punch out for the day if you can. And totally. um, I think as a leader, you have to take time off and you have to let people know that it's okay for them to take time off. And we sort of did it in not a, a scare tactic way, but we're like, you're not carrying it over and you can't <laughs> take it all in the fourth quarter. So do yeah. some gardening, plan some day trips. Um, it's, and it's, it's such a stressful time that people definitely need to, uh, to re recharge and time off yeah. does that for sure. Yeah. So, all right, so you are grounded from a travel perspective because how much of your time did you spend traveling and what do you think the future of business travel looks like? Well, the, on the first question, it, you know, fits and spurts for me, but I'd say on average, maybe a couple, two, three nights a week um, and, and really worked hard to make sure it wasn't more than, than that, but a, but a fair amount of, um, of travel. And you're right, none of that. Um, so, and enjoying this period, it's been a really, um, you know, obviously there's a lot of stress and there's a lot that's problematic, but a silver lining has been the time with family has been great. All my four boys are home, two of them that should be home and two of them, one should be in college and one should be working in Boston, but they're, they're all here, which has been, which has been fantastic. In terms of the future of travel, um, you know, I think we're learning quickly how much can be accomplished. Um, with with you know we use teams or zoom um and how efficient that it can be so i i don't see it bouncing back um would be my guess don't have a crystal ball i don't see mm -hmm. it bouncing back mm -hmm. to the level that it was at before uh, but i don't see it going away either because like we were talking about before there really isn't a substitute for being able to spend time with people um face to face and i and i i think there'll always be a need for that yeah, I am um, actively working to figure out how I never have to leave Maine again. So um, <laughs> I'll, I'll keep you posted. I'll keep you posted on how that, on how that goes. We have clients that want to come all summer long, but no one comes to visit us when in January and February. So. I know. Isn't that crazy? Although that's when you can get restaurant reservations. So, that's true. That's true. so let's talk about um, you get a promotion right at the start of, of the COVID um, crisis or maybe pre-COVID, are you able to fully embrace your new role or are you getting pulled back into your old role? No, I would say, I mean, it was definitely um, interesting timing, but no, I mean, I think fully embrace the new role. I think it actually uh, ended up being fortuitous for us because we're able you know, and stepping into this role to, to better coordinate across all of our operations, wherever they are, including, uh, including right here in Portland. So we've done some things here in Portland that we've used, it, you know, in Ireland and in the UK and vice versa. So, you know, where my role is to help be successful, a lot of times that's just creating the forums and sharing information and best practices so that the, the whole group benefits from learning, whether it's a success or a failure anywhere. Uh, around the various uh, businesses. So it, it's been great, I think, from that perspective. And I think maybe it's kind of sound funny, but I would link it back to the paid time off, you know, getting away, separating um, discussion we just had. And one thing I learned too is, 
if you don't separate, it's you're sending an implicit message to your team and that message is that they can't handle it without you. And I learned early on that actually more often than, than now my team is better at doing uh, what needed to be done uh, than, than I was as an individual. And so, you know, in stepping out of my old role, um, a great, you know, great team, great talent, stepped right into that. And, um, you know, I think giving them room to grow and develop has been a big part of that. Mm -hmm. um, so you mentioned communication. So especially since we're all at home, communication is just critical, um, especially with employees who are anxious about the future of, of companies and how we're going to be able to respond, returning back to work. What have you changed with your communication protocols? What's been working? Has the frequency changed? Yeah, a little bit like we were talking about. So it's more frequent. And then, you know, there's a couple of things that we've done. So we have, um, we have a, a video chat session just like this one that we do with all employees uh, every week actually uh, did it this morning. And what we, you know, what, what, do, what do you learn? Well, you learn that in general, people don't want to listen to, you know, an hour and a half. They want to listen to 15 minutes, 20 minutes. They want to be able to put questions up, get them answered in that kind of a format. So in general, I'd say more frequent and shorter. Shorter. Yeah. Adjusted communications. Yeah. So from this morning, what did you hear from people? What's on people's minds? You know, um, amazingly diverse set of things. I mean, they uh, folks are curious about what's happening in our markets um, and with our client base. They're interested in, um, you know, what we're doing with um, our efforts to slowly reopen. So we started doing that um, in Tennessee with about 5% of our workforce. And here in Portland on June 8th, we'll, um, we'll start doing the same very slowly, completely on a voluntary basis. We've asked employees who are both comfortable and willing and also able to do it. You know, uh, they have the, the ability from a childcare or um, other loved ones, reasons that they otherwise might not be able to come in. So purely voluntary, that, uh, that starts out in June 8th. So a lot of questions about that and how yeah. that's gonna happen. Um, so, and how are you getting input from employees yeah. about what they feel comfortable with? Yeah, I mean, a lot of a lot of good conversations. Those are helpful, but I mean, everybody's on their laptop. You know, every, we're at the point pretty much all eleven thousand employees are are uh, on laptops and and they're remote. So the reality is, like, you send a survey out and say, "Hey, what do you think about X, Y, or Z?" and you'll get eighty percent response within twenty four hours because for the most part, people are people are there and able to bang it out pretty quick. Mm -hmm. Rich and great. I mean, people at UNM, um, I see a couple of alum that dialed in as participants on this call, they can attest. I mean, they are not shy. They will speak their mind. So they'll tell you, what, you know, what, what seems to make sense and what doesn't. And that's, that's good. That's what you need. Yeah. All right, let me start to add some questions uh, from our attendees. Some of these were submitted in advance from John Endicott. Are you planning to keep more employees permanently away from the office as a result of hmm. the coronavirus experience? We saw Facebook announced, I think it was last week, that um, many of their employees can just work from home forever. Yeah, yeah, and it's interesting that that's a really interesting question. I, I definitely, I don't think we want to keep them away from the office. So an employee that wants um, to, to come into the, we, you know, we, we've redone all of our physical space across all of our campuses and it's all open space. People can bring their laptops, work where they want. And, and a lot of folks really like that environment. So we don't want to keep folks away. As soon as, as, soon as it's safe and we feel comfortable, uh, we want people to be able to come into the office if they want. Now, employees that, would rather prefer work from home. Um, you know that that we are learning quickly that that can be very effective, and so we already had about twenty to twenty five percent of our employees working on at least a part time work from home, if not a full time work from home basis. And I think we're learning that that's pretty effective, and in, and in all likelihood, that's something that we would want to expand over time and provide the flexibility. You know, for for employees that that can blossom in that kind of an environment, we'll provide the opportunity. Mm -hmm. I can tell you if I worked at Unum, I would go to that Portland campus all the time because it is spectacular. Oh, that's nice. That's nice of you to say. It's, um, yeah, it's been, it's, 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 we pretty much got done doing all that and then COVID hit and everybody went. So, 
Right, right. Well, at least it, you know, at least it's staying fresh and new. So, right. Um, right. So, okay. Uh, question from Laurie Mack. I'm curious about how you're taking care of employees, the need to reduce salaries, hours, change benefits, or anything related to um, reduced revenue through the pandemic. Um, and also how you see the economy moving forward. But I don't think your revenues are reduced right now because I, I actually think they would be higher. Yeah, so they've held in okay. And even as we've seen some of the disability claims pop up, a lot of, I mean, our, like I said, our business is employee benefits. So as our clients need to reduce employees, then our revenues oh, will go down right. over time. And so okay, right. There is definitely pressure. Now, we tend to, um, we, we tend to be skewed a bit more towards employers that are, I think, weathering this current environment a bit better. Um, mm -hmm. so it hasn't hit us quite as as harshly as it has hit other sectors in the economy, but it, it's a real challenge. And you know, I talk to and watch and, and empathize where you got a lot of businesses that really don't have a choice uh, but then to make changes around the hours worked or furlough employees or have layoffs or change benefits. We've been fortunate; we've not uh, been put in that um, position. Um, and and you know, at the end of the day, that's something that we would want to work really hard and and pursue every other option before we have to go down that path. Just because our business tends to be one where the investment to, to recruit the people that we need and to train them and have people be proficient, it, it's a very significant investment and in our, in our people are our brand. So that's, right. that's, the last, that's the last place we would want to go. Yeah, well, we've been um, fortunate as well that we haven't had any staffing reductions. Um, and our plan is to continue, which I, is pretty remarkable considering um, the business that I'm in. Um, but I think everyone is just so concerned about the tourism industry and also the restaurants in our community and everything that we can do to support them when it's time. That's right. Completely agree. So um, other than uh, through technology, what is one way that Unum has adapted to the pandemic that is now going to be a permanent change in the way you do business? And this question is from Christine Rindo. Mm. Yeah, it's a great question. I, I think where we just touched on for sure. So thinking about uh, work from home, and where we source talent, where people um, show up every day. Um, yeah, I think it, it's kind of an interesting one, but I would say one thing that we've learned and that we would carry forward is the pace of decision making hmm. so, and i apologize so you probably hear some of my kids running around in the background so yeah it's totally fine yeah oh that's good they'll be coming in i'm sure in a minute or two uh so it's um it's the pace of decision making and so a lot of times large organizations you know inevitably um can become uh, a bit slower and a bit more bureaucratic and you just don't have that kind of a luxury um, when something like uh, COVID-19 hits. And so we put some um, processes in place to really empower uh, teams that are closer to the market, closer to customer level. And we're actually measuring the number and the, and the velocity of decisions that we make. And I think that's something that we will take um, into business as usual on the other side of this. Yeah, that's great. And I hadn't heard that before, the pace of decision making. Um... Is, is is very good and I think long term ever you'll you'll benefit from that. This is a great question from Joyce Cassidy. What role do you expect seniors 60 plus to play in the workforce in Maine over the next decade? And how will companies adapt to meet their needs as mature employees? So obviously people 60 plus are going to be in a higher risk um, uh, you know uh, from recovering from COVID. So how do you respond to that part of the workforce? What do you do? That is a great question. And, you know, we've had five generations in our workforce here for a few years now. And so it's part of the, part of the key will be what we've talked about. So you know, we, we don't, um, and we have the luxury because of the business that we happen to be in, we don't want people to feel like they need to come to our physical locations to work. So being flexible about that and making sure people have the technology to be, um, Productive for sure. That's that's number one. If I think about the topic more broadly, though, I think um, you know our philosophy is really built around a meritocracy. So you know where people um, are caring, have talent, have drive. You know, it really doesn't matter um, what potential, what you know, what your age bracket is, or how you identify from a gender point of view, or any anything else. So we're going to do what we can. Um, 
to get that best talent and wherever it lies. So whether it's working from home and being flexible there or, you know, a lot of what we do for our clients. So it's making sure that, that folks have adaptive equipment. So if you need, uh, one of the things I need increasingly these days is bigger keyboards for my thick fingers or you need monitors. Um, you know, it's, it's finding the way to help people be productive that are ready to meet the challenge. Um, let's, uh, well, we're getting ready to take questions from the audience. So if you want to ask questions, you can raise your hand and uh, Strawberry will bring you on live to ask your question. Um, that would be audio only, so you don't have to worry if you haven't showered. And, uh, or you can pop them into the Q&A. So we, we don't take the questions out of the chat because it's kind of too hard to pick them all out from there. So those are the two ways uh, that you can ask Mike questions. So let's talk about community service. One of the things that I admire so much about Unum is you guys are all, always there, whether it's helping you in the United Way or food drives or whatever it is, you engage your employees, but I know you also make investments. So how have you been able to keep that up during this time, especially when those you know classic Unum community service days can't really happen? Yeah, it has had to change and um, change and evolve. So a little bit trickier, but again, it's been um, really heartening to see how people react. And even as they're dealing with so much personally, just that innate sense that we're part of a bigger and broader community and what they can do to help. So it's it's a, everything from um, book drives. I think we just did something in partnership with Educate Maine and put you know, 6,500 books or so into the hands of, of kids as they're all headed home to make sure they're keeping up with their reading, learned, learned all about the importance of reading from my friends at the United Way, Greater Portland. So shout out to Liz and that, that team. Um, and then just making sure that we're there financially. Uh, you know, I'm very fortunate to have a, a good matching gifts program. So I think we've put a few hundred thousand dollars out in COVID related relief, great places like um, Wayside and, and Preble Street. Uh, but you got to be creative. And, and, and actually, while, while most of the in-person volunteer opportunities um, aren't available right now, um, blood drives are particularly important. So I will put a plug in for uh, Febu or February uh, the 3rd, June 3rd, that's what I'm trying to say, next week at the Elks Club, Outer Congress Street. I'll be out there. So anybody that's looking to, um, to donate blood impo as important, more important now than ever, please do so. Yeah, we, we participated in the Distance Saves Lives Blood Drive um, at the Elks in Portland. And I have to tell you that I was nervous about it for like three weeks leading up to it. But man, they do an unbelievable job making you feel safe and um, making you feel comfortable. And it was, uh, it was actually really uplifting to go out and, and contribute your blood and, you know, in a small way, but also just to see people because for me, I, I you know, I hadn't seen folks in a long time. So um, thank you for your continued support of the community. So um, Strawberry, do we um, have any raised hands? We do have a hand raised. Um, all right. Stephanie, Stephanie Trice Gill, you are all set to go ahead and ask your question. Hi, how are you? Um, so um, Mike, thank you so much. It's a pleasure to hear you speak. And um, I'm just curious, you're uh, working internationally and um, what challenges are you facing in staffing and recruiting for a international and multilingual customer base? Mm. Yeah, that's a great question. So thanks for asking it, Stephanie. I'd say the, the majority, so when we're, when we're solving for some of our international businesses, I mean, we're sourcing talent right in those markets. Um, it just has always been our, our best and winning formula to do that. I would say, uh, particularly here in the U.S., um, being able to bring uh, multiple languages has become, you know, just absolutely imperative in doing business. So our customer base just kind of mirrors the U.S. workforce, and as that U.S. workforce has become, you know, more diverse, being able to meet people where they're at is really important. And I, and I would say, just being frank, I mean, that, that is one of the challenges. There's so many great positives about um, you know, our employees here in Maine about just the work ethic, the, the sense of integrity and community, um, and over, overwhelmingly positive. But one of the drawbacks is, is the, the lack of diversity. And so it tends to be a state where it is challenging to find um, talent service clients that we've got out across the country that come from very different backgrounds. And so, you know, for me, when I think things like, you know, Maine leaning in a bit to things like um, immigration and drawing, you know, trying to draw in more diverse, diverse groups and being more welcoming. 
that makes sense for a lot of reasons, but, but selfishly, one of those reasons is we, we need a more diverse workforce. A uh, question from Tim Seavey. How do you see the sales process changing where face-to-face -face is probably considered more important and how are intermediaries handling this new reality? Yeah, that's a great question, Tim. Nice to hear from you, even uh, even just uh, via Lisa's voice. But it's um, yeah, it's it's a, it can be a big it can be a very big um, change. And like I was saying, I think the, the pickup of digital tools has definitely increased. And so we're doing things like where we would have um, had folks flying in from around the country to participate in a finalist meeting to talk about employee benefits at a large employer. Today, those things are happening just like this meeting is happening today with um, with Zoom meetings. And so you're you know providing documents um, digitally versus bringing binders and all those sorts of things. So there, there's a lot that's moving and changing. What I'd say is like the, all the kind of the medium and the pace of it has changed, but the kind of at the core of what we do is um, you know help people when they get sick or get hurt. And in general, what I'd say is people are more aware now than ever, you know, probably directly as a result of this environment of the kind of the fragility of their income and their health and, and that of their family. And so if you can find better ways that are more efficient um, to get basic, you know, financial protection to people, that's, that's a very good thing. And I think, I think technology has played a big role in, in, in the adoption of it is really accelerated. And I think that's gonna continue well past COVID-19. I, I will, this, this may sound like I'm sucking up to one of our sponsors, but Kristen King is our um, benefits rep at Mainstay Media. She works at Hub. And um, if we can't have Kristen at open enrollment, people are going to be disappointed. She has built such an incredible rapport. And it's not because she seduces us with tchotchkes, but she really <laughs> knows everything. And so I just really hope by open enrollment time, she can get back in, in, front, of our, in front of our office. Uh, um, and that the Chosky doesn't. It, the Chosky doesn't hurt. You, no, it doesn't. It, it doesn't hurt. Yeah. Like, you don't yeah. That's why you love her. Uh, especially since they did have hand sanitizer, so that was even pre-COVID. So <laughs> keep it coming, Kristen. Um, okay, this is a great question. Any tips for employers supporting good mental health of employees during this strange time? Uh, what a great question. You know, what a great question, and, and thinking of, uh, about that a lot, um, and it's for the reasons we talked about. I mean, just. You think about um, fear and the isolation that can often be sort of all wrapped up in an unfortunate combination in, in the world we're living in today. Um, I, I think from an employer, the first thing is, is just recognize like, it's very tempting when you think about a, uh, your employees to think about them as a cohort. And I think, you know, I, I've definitely done that, but have learned the hard way that really when you think about people and how unique their situations are, particularly in a time like this, you really have a universe of one. If you've got, yeah. you've got 10 people, you've got 10 different situations. If you've got 15, you've got 15 different situations. If it's 11,000, the same. That means you know, being patient, not making assumptions, um, reaching out uh, with mental um, health. The biggest things that I think you can do early on or that we've tried to do is just lower the stigma about raising your hand and making sure that people feel very, very comfortable um, doing things like needing to take um, a day for mental health when they need help to be willing to raise their hand and seek help as an employer. Make sure that you know you're working with folks like at, at Hub to make sure that you've got good programs in place through your health provider or, or elsewhere, so that your employees have access. Telehealth has exploded. Uh, I don't know mm -hmm. what. But yep. Certainly, my family has gone from. A few, you know, this period we would have had two or three trips to the doctor, but uh, a lot of that's now ha happening, um, happening digitally. And that's, you know, that's probably, to be honest, a better way and often to deliver good mental health because a lot of times it's, it's episodic, you know, it's not scheduled a, a, an appointment two months out. It's like, I, I need some help right now. And so mm -hmm. having professionals is, is good. So look at, look at your benefit programs for sure. But the biggest thing is just a lot of, um, openness and inclusion and understand that people are, are dealing with a lot of things, some of which you know, most of which you don't. 
Right, right, for sure. Um, the pandemic has caused some talent to move out of urban centers like NYC and Boston, and Maine seems really attractive right now. Have you seen an uptick in the amount of job seekers, and do you, do you anticipate an increase in the amount of talent available? I do, um, and I, I actually don't. I don't. I don't know for sure if if there's long term. Um, migrations back out of cities because we've actually started to see over a couple of decades a little bit more of a migration back into some of particularly the mid-tier cities in the U.S. So I don't I, it's less about that. I think what we're learning is that um, you know the opportunities for folks in a lot in a lot of sectors not all but a lot of sectors is going to be working from you know working from home in a lot of different places. So it, it, I think increasingly for a lot of jobs it's going to be who do you want to work for and where do you want to live? And those don't have to be very tightly connected. Um, and so yeah. I think a lot of pressure on us as an employer to say, what's our value proposition to people? Because they're going to have more choices uh, of employers to work at um, if they're talented and good. That, that puts the, the onus on us to have a really strong value proposition to attract. And yeah, I, I do think when, when, when you can separate it and you can, li you can live where you want to live, I think Maine's going to do very, very well. And, and I think so. Well. Yeah. Um, Kate Tillotson wants to know what your favorite question to ask in a job interview is. Oh my goodness. Yeah. So, um, my favorite question is, I'll give you, I'll, I'll give you the question and Lisa, you can choose if you want to answer it or not yourself. But my very, my question, Gosh. let's say you're driving home at the end of a day and let's say it's a little bit late. So let's say it's, you know, six or seven at night, you've worked all day. And you should be drained, right? You should be tired. Tough day in the newsroom. I don't know. But you don't feel that way. You you got the windows down because obviously it's you know it's beautiful weekend here in Maine. The music's going, and you feel great. You feel energized. What happened at work today that left you after a long day of it feeling like that? And I won't put you on the spot to answer. No, but. no, no, no. I can answer that because it happened this morning. We got a note from a subscriber, actually a new subscriber who said, I just subscribed to your paper because you have not only entertained, engaged me, but you've also informed me with everything that I need to know about the rapidly changing world that we live in right now. So when people validate why they subscribe, that makes everyone in our organization feel good. Well, I'm wondering if my wife Ruby sent that because I don't know any more reader of the, she, that's what she does every morning. She's on her phone going through reading all of the uh, headline stories and then she'll tell me, did you know this? And I'll say, no, I didn't. I didn't. And know you that. do now. I know. See, right. It's, well, yeah. if you answer the question now, Lisa, I'd say is like, you're a purpose driven person. So where you're like, what motivates you, what drives you is a sense of purpose that the work that you do is meaningful to people. Well, thank you. Thank you, Mike. And you didn't even know you were telling me that. I if didn't I asked know. you, why do you do the work? You wouldn't, you wouldn't necessarily tell Oh, my that. gosh. Okay, you are going to host um, seminars on how to really pull information out of people in, in interviews when they don't even know they're sharing it. So thank you for I that. That's, that's, that's your job, Lisa, not mine. Yeah. Um, all right. So Steve Woods, this is our last question. How might COVID-19 change or accelerate systematic changes to healthcare and insurance in the U.S.? Um, you know, I hate, to, I hate to keep coming back to the same thing, but I do think um, telehealth is going to come quickly. I think inefficiencies in the healthcare system, have, you know, they're, they're under a lot of pressure because of the cost of delivering healthcare. I think that's, gonna, that's only going to accelerate through this period. Um, I think access probably if I had to underscore one thing and whether that's that whether that's technology or it's opening up um, networks or it's more creative delivery methods. Uh, I think that's going to be one of the key words is, is more people being able to get the care they need in a more diverse set of ways that meet their particular needs. So I'd say moving away from a very standard one size fits all approach to healthcare towards much more options and much more uh, tailoring to the individual. How's great. That? I think that is a great way to wrap it up. And I just want to say, I mean, it's a kind of a quick on the spot assessment, but I am going to say that based on your performance today at Like a Boss Now, we are going to invite you back to Like a Boss Original Recipe. So get ready for that invite. <laughs> oh, wow. That's, yeah. that's, that's immediate feedback. I was really good. Yep. 
Yep. Um, I was going to go get, we did get a new puppy, a new golden retriever puppy. So things were going badly. I was just going to bring out my puppy and just you know, save the whole thing. Always go, always go with the puppy. You can never, you can never go wrong. Thank you for being so um, generous with your time, Mike, and also your transparency into how Unum is managing through COVID-19. So to my friends who have joined us today, that wraps up Like a Boss Now. We will be back in the fall, as Kate said, with Clayton Rose, the president of Bowdoin. And I know a couple people on the call have a real vested interest in hoping that Bowdoin is back on schedule at full, at full strength in the fall. Um, also, Liz Cotterslacks from the United Way will be joining us and really anxious to hear how things are going from her perspective on their, uh, their Thrive campaign. Next week, near a term, we have astronaut Jessica Meyer joining us for Main Voices live stream, which is an evening um, event. Oh, was that the new puppy yeah, we just heard? Right on cue. Yeah, and uh, I'm sure Strawberry's already put a link uh, in the chat on how to register for the Jessica Meyer um, event. We also have Making It Work on Wednesday, where we're going to be, be talking about how do you bring new hires on when everyone's working from home? So how to make that first impression um, impactful and successful. And I would just like to give a special thank you to Strawberry Mosney, who is the executive producer of Like a Boss Now. She is just amazing in her adoption of technology and just making it all seamless. We're really proud of how we've pulled off this series. And also to Kate Simmons Tillotson, our director of business development, for making certain that we were able to secure revenue to support our journalism, which is so critical right now. And of course, to our sponsors, Hub International and Bernstein Shore. We couldn't have done it without you, Mike. Thank you so much. Good luck with the puppy. That is like, that's ambitious during this time. Yeah, because having eight people here wasn't enough, so we had to add another dog. <laughs> well, at least there are plenty of people to feed her and walk her, and walk yeah, her so there you go. Answer. Yeah. All right. Thank you again, Mike, and have a great weekend. Stay safe, everyone, and keep the distance. Thank you, Lisa.